welcome to this conversation with our host today, Professor Dr. Peter Zeck, founder and CEO of the Red Dot Design Award, and his guest, the remarkable Jean-Claude Bivet. Jean-Claude, uh, congratulations on becoming the first ever recipient of the Red Dot Personality Prize. Thank you very much. I'm very proud uh, to have received this award, especially I have a philosophy in my life, Always be first, different, unique. <laughs> and here with the trophy, I, that's, that's oh, I am first. <laughs> I'm the first. Very good, very good. Well, look, for those of uh, our viewers who perhaps don't know you, and many of our viewers will know you, but if I may speak a little of your heritage and success, um, I think it's not understating the case that you're probably the Swiss watchmaking industry's greatest living legend, if not one of the most fascinating and innovative minds in the watch sector. And over a 40-year career, you have uh, rejuvenated and dramatically accelerated the success, not of one global watch brand, but of five. And I think you're probably the only person ever to have done that, certainly in Switzerland. Your career started with uh, Audemars Piguet in the 1970s. You moved to Omega, where you're in charge of Omega Gold. In 1982, I think a key step, you resurrected the moribund brand of Blancpain, purchasing the rights to the name for, what, 22,000 Swiss francs? which is what, about 20,000 euros, and converting that by 1992 to 60 million uh, Swiss francs sale to the Swatch Group. Now, that must have been, I'm guessing, a difficult decision at that time, but nevertheless, I'd open new doors for you because then you were able to return to Omega, uh, and between 1992 and 2003, you introduced the brand to James Bond and triple sales in 10 years. Then, in 2004, as CEO of the French brand Hublot, you developed the groundbreaking Big Bang Chronograph, which was presented in 2005, and company sales blossomed under your leadership from 25 million to 200 million Swiss francs within four years. And the brand was subsequently sold to LVMH in 2008. Then, in due course, as head of watchmaking at LVMH, Louis Vuitton Moet Hennessy, from 2014, you oversaw the Hublot, Tag Heuer, and Zenith brands, and to this day, you remain their only non-executive president. In 2012, you were awarded uh, an honorary doctorate by the Business School of Lausanne, and in January of this year, you received France's highest merit of order, the uh, Legion of Honor which was established by none other than Napoleon Bonaparte in 1802. Uh, Peter, if I may, you know, it's clear that Jean-Claude uh, fits the accolade of the Red Dot Personality Prize to an exceptional degree. That is, a creative leader who has been able to create significant change in a sector, like at the level of a whole sector, uh, and has been able to see opportunities to create change for good. And just before we get into our conversation, Peter, if I may turn my attention to you. I've, I've known you for many years since we sat together on the exit board, now the World Design Organization, which you're still a senator of. And I was at the table when you created the concept of the World Design Capital. Um, and I know since its inaugural run in Torino in 2008, that continues to this day with phenomenal success. I believe in 2016, you were awarded honorary citizenship of the city of Seoul. And I know through your personal vision and the growing international success over many years of the Red Dot Award, you've accelerated the success of numerous design-led companies and helped them through design to connect their brand to the wishes and desires of their customers, improving quality of life and delivering greater sustainable growth to those companies committed to using good design well. You're a professor of business communication management at the University of Applied Arts in Berlin, where you've taught for 17 years. And in August last year, you were awarded Germany's Federal Cross of Merit for your decades of commitment to design culture. So I'm very humbled to have the opportunity to try and facilitate the discussion between these two remarkable gentlemen here today. As our host today, Peter, and as the initiator of this prize, why did you create this award? And what do you feel are the key factors from the Red Dot's perspective uh, as to why you think Jean-Claude is the right person to receive this for the first time? Okay, let's start with the first question. Uh, since many, many years, we have the uh, special uh, recommendation of the design team of the year, uh, which is just focusing on the design, the design team and leaders of design. But uh, on the other hand, we have to recognize that design never stands alone. 
this is the big difference between art and design. You know, mm -hmm. an artist can always do whatever he wants, and he is not responsible to anybody. But designers, they are responsible to their clients, and uh, it depends sometimes very much on the client how good the design at the end is. If the client is is not brave enough and uh, is a little bit uh, anxious, then very good ideas were killed in the very beginning. And uh, so that brought us to the idea that we need some leadership outside of design in the industries and people who are brave, strong, and uh, with good skills of leadership who open the door for good designs. And uh, this was the f idea behind this uh, Red Dot Personality Prize. Uh, okay, to the second point, who is the best person to be the first who gets this prize? Of course, we were looking for the leaders who really changed whole industries or the whole manufacturing processes and, and, and things. And uh, uh, so we came, obviously, to uh, Jean-Claude Beaver because Jean-Claude is a, a ma magnificent person in, in, in the watchmaking industry. And uh, I, I was very happy to meet him several years ago. I think the first time I saw him uh, it was a very amazing moment in Tokyo. He jumped into Tokyo, gave a speech, and went back home to Switzerland. Yeah. This was very impressive. And uh, I, uh, I, I could see his, his strong character and uh, the way the people admire him in the watch industry. So uh, we were thinking about the right person who will be the first, and I think we did the best choice uh, with uh, John claude who really did an amazing job for the watchmaking industry uh, by combining also uh, business and design. Because when I come to the, one of your, your most successful watches, the Big Bang, the Big Bang is uh, still surviving over 10 years, and... Uh, the brilliant idea behind it is to change the designs all the time, to bring in different kind of people uh, with new ideas on the Big Bang. And uh, this is, is a, a tremendous success. And it was also awarded with the Red Dot Best of the Best several years ago. Fantastic. Um, Jean-Claude, I think uh, there are many uh, videos and interviews out there, which I'm sure many of our viewers have seen. We you talk with uh, considerable passion about passion itself, about love, and about the need for having purpose and uh, being open to new influences and new ideas. And I thought it would be interesting, because this is uh, within the context of the red dot, I thought it would be interesting to try and steer the conversation around some of the issues that might be of interesting, of particular interest to a design audience. And it might even be that a design audience doesn't necessarily think of luxury, mechanical, oat orology uh, as a, a key design target, as it were. And one of the things that intrigues me is, um, given your experience across five global brands, sitting at the highest levels, creating some of those brands, in what way do you think design was perceived at board level? in those organizations and have you seen a change in the way that that perception has evolved over the years how important is design to the watch industries thank you very much uh, for my introduction you know uh, when i was listening to you i said to myself what a pity that i retire <laughs> i should go on <laughs> so if i don't retire it it will be your fault huh? <laughs> we will remember this day <laughs> okay uh, no to answer your question um you know a watch on your wrist um looks from a certain distance like every watch and um, for many years uh, the brand the watch brands were making the difference through technology or through accuracy this watch is more accurate etc etc these were all very rational elements at a certain point, starting in the 80s, when more or less every brand was at the same development, 
people started to say, maybe we should make the, the difference between brand A and brand B through the shape. And the shape is a combination of design and uh, technology. So the design was introduced, I would say, really in a very conscious way uh, in the 80s by one extraordinary designer, the greatest designer on planet for watches. His name is Gerald Genta. The man uh, uh, died a few years ago, unfortunately. He was my master, by the way. He was my mentor, by the way. And he brought, for the first time, a design in a watch. A design, uh, and the design of that watch was called the Royal Oak from a brand, a Swiss brand, uh, Audemars Piguet. And this design showed screws from the outside, a little bit like in Paris, Pompidou Center. Yes. The Pompidou Center is a very special design because all the infrastructure is visible from the outside. Yes. And from Genta on came, I, I would say, the period of design has started with Gerard Genta and with the Royal Oak. And since then, design has become extremely important because it's the only way today to make a distinction and people who buy an expensive or luxury watch, they want the watch to be recognized. If nobody recognizes the watch, that means you are extremely sophisticated, but normally people want to show who they are. They want to show their personality. They want to show their taste. They want to show the, even their wealth. Showing is our nature. That's why we dress in a certain way. That's why we have certain shoes. That's why we have a certain car. We want to show people who we are. And so the watch has become an instrument to show who we are. An extraordinary instrument, because if I don't want to show who I am, you will not see my watch. If I want to show who I am, you will see. And then I have the choose. I show it, I don't show it. And then I can also choose, do I have a, a, a watch that is arrogant? Do I have a watch in gold? Do I have an understated watch? So you play. And the watch has become an instrument of showing of communication. It communicates to others. And that period started, I would say, with Gerald Genta in, in 1971. And it became extremely strong in the 80s. And we are still today on this trend of the design is one of the important elements of the watch next to the art that is inside or next to the technology that is inside. Great. And I mean, Peter, do you, would you recognize that journey in other companies? I mean, you've been uh, connected to so many global brands using design to improve their futures of themselves and for their customers. Do, do you see that trend as well, you know, from the 80s that design was becoming more recognized at board level? <clears throat> no, it depends on the, on the industries, on the, on the different kind of uh, branches. For example, if you go to furniture, uh, in, in the furniture industry, design is, is uh, there from the very beginning, you know. Uh, but we have uh, other branches, for example, medical equipment in those days and this days is very important. And, uh, you know, when I started with Red Dot, uh, there was very low interest in, in, in medical equipment uh, things. But then we had um, a reform, a kind of a tax reform in several countries so that uh, people had to, to buy or to, to pay for, for some equipment, uh, which they became before for free. So when people have to make a decision where they put the money in, then immediately they change their mind. You know, if I get something for free, I take it. I don't care. But if I have to pay for something, then I start to observe better and then I want to make my own choice. So that turned the situation in the, in the area, in the industries of medical equipment 
um, dramatically. Mm -hmm. So from those days, we can see that in this area now, design became a very, very important factor. Uh, and uh, nobody has expected that before, because if you, if you think medical equipment is something that we need, and uh, th there should be just a function in it. But this is not true. Uh, nowadays, we see that people, as Jean-Claude mentioned before, we want to show, you know, I worked for a long time for a German uh, opt optician, uh, Mr. Firma. And you know, in the, in the past, we had only three pairs of glasses, different pairs of glasses, which you could get for free from your insurance. And immediately, everybody could see on your nose whether you were a wealthy or unwealthy person, because you had one of this, those three things on your nose, and then everybody see, oh, he cannot afford much better uh, glasses. Mr. Freeman changed this, and he uh, introduced over 100 different kind of models for the same price that the insurance paid. So immediately, he turned the glasses from a kind of a medical device into a fashion object. And uh, this happens in many, many, many kind of industries where people are forced to put in money and to make their own selection, or if you offer them the choice of selection, that makes a big difference. And uh, yes, and, and Jean-Claude uh, gave a wonderful example of how that worked in the watch industry. Um, because in the, in, the, in the previous times, watches were just mechanics and money or less money. But nowadays, you can wear a watch that looks perfectly and is not very expensive, but is very well designed. So this, this is a dramatic change in, in this industry at all. Yes, do you think, uh, Jean-Claude, um, yeah, what, what would you say in response to that? What, what is, I, I would say, of course, I, I, I didn't know the story of the glasses. And glasses are, like watches, a communication tool today. Uh, especially in China, it's so important. And uh, a lot of Chinese are wearing uh, uh, glasses. And when people cannot wear uh, optical glasses, they still want to show, so they buy sunglasses. Yes. <laughs> Even if there's no sun. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and when when the what when the Gerard Genta made the first uh, really uh, uh, path into the design uh, concept, then what happened? The design brought the watches into fashion. Because yes. in the 60s, in the 50s, in the 70s, if you would open a fashion magazine, they would never speak about watches. No. Because watches were just instruments to read what time it is. So thanks to the design, the, watch, uh, uh, the watches entered the fashion world. And once we were into the fashion world, then the fashion world would promote indirectly our watches. That's why we have today uh, the part of the watches in any fashion magazine, in PR articles, or even in uh, advertisement is extremely important. And fashion has helped to develop watches among people. And to, you could ask the question, why today anybody is wearing a watch when you have time indication everywhere, in every airport, every uh, uh, railway station, every car, every computer, every phone? Why do you want a watch? To, for the emotion, to own something on your wrist and for the pleasure, the, quality, the, the pleasure of the eyes. And you know, I say to people, if you buy an expensive watch and you have it on your wrist, don't look what time it is. Look at your watch. Very good. <laughs> don't look at the <laughs> time it is. <laughs> you don't care, but you have the beauty and you have a piece of art on your wrist. I think, the, the, I think there is an important point that you made between uh, watch design and fashion, because that opens also the way personally for you to, to create a new kind of branding for watches. You know, before the brand was just related to craftsmanship and to the manufacturer, but nowadays you, you have 
totally new opportunities to to create a new brand and and to to give relationship between brands fashion and watch and and you are a master of uh, how to manage it <laughs> yes it's true it gave us this opportunity absolutely to use uh, um, um, for instance uh, using sport it, depending in different sports uh, some brands are going is also a communication they they show their brandings some in the formula one some others in polo uh, uh, and and today or like the ambassadors we can choose ambassadors so the watch business has totally changed from the i would say from the beginning of the 80s and today it's another it's another job it's another business it has become much more branding has become much more marketing much more uh, pr uh, uh, etc etc so we are now in another field and that has helped us to uh, uh, develop our our business to that degree everybody today not everybody but a lot of people are very much what i call watch conscious they know what what is the role of a watch why do i buy it they don't buy to read what time it is and you know to explain this and to make a very strong provocation in night in 2005 no 2000 yeah 2005 we have made a watch that was called all black where you could not read what time it is because the hands were black the indexes were black the dial was black and the watch case was black 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 as people would say they would tell me how can i read i said you don't buy the watch to read you buy the watch because what it is what it represents and what it tells you <laughs> and yeah. and we made 250 pieces limited of this all black we could have sold 4,000 because people were amazed and people loved it. That is, the, that is the proof that you don't buy the watch to read what time it is. But if in addition to all this, you can still read, okay, why not? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> we accept that you can read, okay. Let's yeah. accept it. <laughs> Thank you, Jean Claude. Do you think um do you think that that, that 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 issue around the psychology and the semantics of the language of the watch, creating association value for the user or the customer, um do you think that is threatened by the new technologies coming along or the you know the mindset of the millennials or even generation Z or the alpha? Brilliant question, brilliant question. The mechanical watch has something very special because it is eternal. Big Ben in London is 150 years old and it works, it works. Uh, uh, I have the watch of my father from 1947, it works. So art is eternal love is eternal and god if you believe in god god is eternal that's it nothing else can be uh, can be said it's eternal as a mechanical watch belongs to the watchmaking art and not to the watchmaking technology the watchmaking art is also eternal and the 1947 watch that my mother gave my to my father when they got engaged is on my wrist some evenings when i, I take care of the watch but some evenings i put it on my wrist now a technology technology goes into the future not by repeating the heritage but by killing the past which we call obsolescence so every technological watch is due to become obsolete every mechanical watch is due to be eternal so eternity has no competition so eternity <laughs> nobody can compete to eternity so the mechanical watch in my sense that's why now today the collecting watches the vintage watches the market has exploded because people suddenly realize hey this 1947 watch or this 1965 or whatever 
wow, there is value. There is value because it's art, and art is eternal. Um, Peter, the, the role of craft is something that you and I have talked a little bit about from time to time. And I guess in the watch industries, it might be the case that a, a watchmaker, I suppose, would probably think of themselves maybe primarily as a craftsman, is that right, or a designer? And I just wonder what is your thought on that, like the relationship between design and craft, and then we can see what Jean-Claude thinks. Yeah, I, you know, if you ever have visited uh, a watchmaking place, and like I could do with Hublot and, and several other uh, producers, and when you see uh, the passion watchmakers have and, and the way they work in this little tiny thing, uh, or how to how to do all these different parts, then of course it is a combination of craftsmanship and, as John would say, art. But not in the sense of fine art. It is a directed art. is is an art of a kind of giving function to something in a very sophisticated manner, in a very sophisticated way. So we have in the world of our daily life, we have so many objects which are perfectly designed and they have never seen a professional designer behind them, you know? And, and in the watch industry, I think uh, this is the same story, you know? You have uh, this, this uh, old watches, very beautiful made, and if you look into them, you see both. You see craftsmanship, manufacturing, and, and of course, you see art and design. But this is a kind of design that comes out of, of the making, out of the process of making the profession of the people who work in this area. That makes a big, big difference. Um, and of course, this times have changed today, as we mentioned before. Nowadays, watchmaking or the, the selling of watches is, is a different kind of business than it used to be in the, in the long past ago. Um, watches are brands, watches are part of fashion, watches are part of my expression, of my showing. So, and in, in these times, design plays a different kind of role in the watchmaking process. So from, let's say, from an origin, natural process of designing something hit, uh, to the way of a kind of more artificial, uh, constructed, and, and uh, installed process of, of, of designing something. Uh, that makes uh, the business very exciting. And uh, of course, people like Jean-Claude, uh, they can play on this kind of tools, on these instruments uh, to, to create the best sound uh, out of it. And uh, that makes the difference. Yeah, Jean-Claude, I think you, uh, you once said that um, the watchmaking industries came to Switzerland well, when it came to Switzerland with the French watchmakers um, back in the uh, 17th century, that they discovered that cheesemakers had the right artisanal mentality uh, to deliver fantastic craftsmanship, and uh, that you know the qualities of patience and uh, the, the 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 striving for the highest quality finish, as it were. Um, and I know you make 5,000 kilos of cheese a year, but I, I didn't want to ask you about cheese. I just wanted, to, again, just to stay with this idea of the, the distinctions between craft and the concept of design. And I just, I'd be interested to hear what you're, I'd be curious to hear what your thinking is on, on that distinction. I think craft and design, um, they are, they must be in total synergy and they must be co they must be they must be coherent with the image of the brand <laughs> uh, a brand is limited in its design uh, by the way it has communicated uh, Hublot, we have a, a strict limit if we lose our shape we are not anymore Hublot. so the design in Hublot is extremely difficult because it's only little things that are nearly invisible. Uh, I sometimes I say uh, we have to make the invisible visible. <laughs> the invisibility make the invisibility visible. Uh, so it's a clear combination 
between craftsmanship, between brand image and, uh, uh, and, and design. So it makes the design difficult because you have these const uh, the, the, constraints. You, you have to, to follow uh, the, the brand identification, the brand image, and you have also to follow what the technology, the craftsmanship gives you as, a, as, as, a, as dimension or thickness. Um, uh, and you must be extremely current between the three. How, how did you, as CEO, when you were at Hublot, I mean, would you have thought of yourself as a design manager? Or, you know, someone oh, who yes. was actually somehow either managing all of these different strands and threads to bring them together to, to create the symphony that is the final watch? You know, uh, uh, I have always been attracted by the product. Uh, um, and that my passion is the product. And I have always been close to the product, and I have always influenced my designer. Uh, although I'm not a designer personally, but I'm more, I would say, a product manager. I manage the, the whole thing. Uh, it must be current, uh, it must uh, follow or show or not show uh, the craftsmanship. Um, and it, it, it must enter uh, the brand image. So I have always been very close to that. And I have always loved watches with my eyes. The, through the eye, it goes into my blood, and from the blood, it goes into my heart. Uh, and sometimes then it goes up to my head. Uh, to my brain, because if I buy, I need then the money. <laughs> so, <laughs> because as you know, I have one of the biggest watch collection uh, in the world. And uh, I always say to young people who start in vintage, I, I tell them, buy first with your eyes, and then double check <laughs> with your budget. And uh, But if you buy with your eyes, and the budget is in your pocket, then nothing can be wrong. Because some people say, ah, shall I buy this brand or this brand or that brand? I say, no, 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 no. Start first to buy with the eyes. Everything comes from the eyes. And then double check with the money. And if, if the two are matching, go and buy the watch. That is my philosophy. And that has been also my philosophy all the time. And when I, when I had designers for Omega, I have, by the way, I, the same designer, the same, made for me Blota, he made Omega, <laughs> he made Umlu, he made Tag Heuer, and he made Zenit. The same guy, starting uh -huh. in 19, with me in 1979, the same. But I gave him constantly totally different directions. And I had, I had to say, no, not like this, you know. So the role of the product manager is as important in a certain way than the one of the, of the designer. And the, if the two are in symbiosis, in, mm -hmm. in total synergy, then, wow, it, it gets fantastic. And nobody would ever think when I mentioned those five brands that it has been done by the same designer and uh, 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 surveyed by the same product manager that I was. John Prude, this is a perfect explanation of the Red Dot Personality Prize, because what you just described is exactly your achievement, you know, and it's very, very hard also to direct, to give direction to the designers, and especially if you work with one on five brands. This is extraordinary, and uh, I think, you are the right person to be the first in this. I know you've. I you've, love it. Thank <laughs> you very much. <laughs> I know you've. And it's interesting because I know you've talked uh, elsewhere about the role of Karl Lagerfeld. Also, this idea of orchestrating or managing uh, the the delivery of very different brand mentalities, but yet being the person behind the mind behind, as it were. You know, Karl Lagerfeld. He has designed during 30 years Chanel. Every new collection looked 100% Chanel, 0% Karl Lagerfeld. 
Yes. In the, at the same time, he has directed Fendi. Every Fendi collection looked 100% Fendi, not at all Karl Lagerfeld. That's genius. The yes. guy could put the, the, the shirt of Chanel today and this tonight the shirt of Fendi, and nobody would, would ever think that it's the same guy who did this. That was also always my reference, because some designers, they want to impose you their view. And I say to this designer, hey, sorry, you are not the boss. The boss is the customer. Mm -hmm. And my Chanel customer, he wants Chanel. He doesn't want <laughs> a, a, a design from you. So you must enter into the brand. And then you must understand the brand. And then you must respect the brand. And then you must love the brand. And then you can create. But as long as you haven't done this exercise, you are just a designer. Fantastic. Jean-Claude, what, uh, what do you think um, you take away from winning this uh, prestigious uh, award? What, what does it mean for you? You have won so many awards in your life. You have created so much success. What does it mean for you to have a design award from Red Dot? Sorry, a personality award it, from Red Dot. I think it's the two more, the two more important um, um, awards I ever got. That's the second one. And the first one was this uh, medal from uh, Bonaparte, Napoleon. <laughs> he was not there to give it to me, but he <laughs> 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 was the ambassador of France. <laughs> but uh, those two uh, uh, awards, they mean for me uh, achievement. Because myself, I have one friend and I have also one enemy. My best friend is my doubt, and my worst enemy is my doubt. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the doubt comes every night, and he says to me, sometimes 3 o'clock this morning, it was 4.30, hey, get up, I have something to check with you. I said, fuck you, I, what do you want? No, we want to check what you were, were doing yesterday. So at 4.30, I get up. And I rework the whole thing because my doubt doesn't let me go. So the doubt is a friend because he helps you to double check. He helps you to listen to others. He helps you to look at uh, other, uh, other opportunities. So the doubt is a friend and the doubt is also the enemy. Because I'm structured as a man with doubts, the award from the French and the award from Peter, wow, they tell me, hey, Viva son, come on, you have done it. So it's an it's a, it's a extremely great, enormous satisfaction for me. And I say also, <laughs> hey, with all this, is it now time to stop or is it time to go on? It might be the question, I don't know him, uh, I, and if I would know him, I would ask, of Federer. He has won 20 uh, grand titles. Shall he, when he's now 38, shall he stop or shall he go on? He might answer, I will go on as long as I enjoy. And I should take example of him and say, hey, Beaver, go on as long as you enjoy it. <laughs> so, yes. Jean-Claude, I can encourage you, you know, on purpose, we never will give an award for the lifetime work of somebody, because this is like a gravestone. Yes. You know? And we, we do not want to do this. We want to encourage people, as you mentioned before, we want to show how good your work was so far, and that you should continue with more energy for the future. So please continue. Yes, I think now uh, the decision is close to be made. <laughs> ah, <very good. laughs> I will remember this uh, day and uh, the 1045 Zoom uh, conference. They, that <laughs> will be a big part of my life, you know. Very Fantastic, Jean-Claude. Um, Peter, would you like to say a few words to Jean-Claude 
um, about the, the the way in which the red dot you see red dot evolving uh, because of course the, the changes to design at the moment I know we've only five or so minutes left but the changes to uh, design in the world today particularly given the circumstances we are living through at the present time I mean how do you see red dot evolving and is there anything Jean Claude that then after that you might add to that conversation? You know, the, 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 the history of Red Dot goes back just to, to the uh, economy after the Second World War, and this was very strongly focusing on products. And people were, were really keen to see new, uh, beautiful design products, uh, and they went to the exhibition and they, they bought the books where they could see this. Nowadays, we have a new situation. We have a combination of inside and outside. Products have become in many areas just black boxes. So the design is inside, as Jean-Claude mentioned also about the watches before. But if you take a, a, a mobile phone, for example, a mobile, all the mobile phones look almost the same from outside, but the technology and the design is inside. It's also a different level of how to experience design. In the, in the past, you experienced design by putting, by, by switching things on and off. Nowadays, you interact with the things. And nowadays, you have your own experience by using things. And that brings us to more and more into the field of communication. And communication also brings us to the world of branding. So this has changed a lot. And from our product design award, we went to communication design award. So, and we can see that more and more companies who win in product design, that they also want to win awards in communication design. And last year we created something new. We said that we get created a new prize for branding as well. So now P uh, companies understand that branding, communication and product is one thing together. This has brought us a dramatic change in the, in the world of design and also in the world of uh, design awards. Uh, we uh, observe this uh, on time, I think. And um, there is another point that communication agencies tell me a lot. You know, there is a very famous prize in Cannes and uh, the communication agencies, they say very often, Red Dot is the only award which is known by our clients as well, because clients win sometimes a red dot for their products. And then if, they, if the agency wins a red dot for the communicational work, then the client knows about it. Uh, in, in many, many other cases, the client does not care about the communication design awards. But uh, this is the big difference. And uh, I think it will continue in this way. Do you think uh, the, the current situation with regard to COVID-19 is going to make dramatic changes in design? I, I know I want to ask Jean-Claude that as well. Um, a little bit, I would say, because we come back to normal life. Uh, we should not be affected too much by that. You know, we will probably have more touchless devices in the future. And we will we have more security devices uh, to protect people from each other. This will, might be an outcome out of this, but, uh, you know, life is much more than this kind of virus, you know. Uh, so I hope that we come back to normal very, very soon and that this will be just an episode in, uh, in our very long lifetime. Uh, no. We should not be affected too much of it. Uh, no, and we no, should what, always what, make what, it Jean-Claude, what's, what's your take on that? I'm very pleased to hear what Peter said about the future of uh, Red Dot. Uh, I think he is absolutely right. Uh, design applies to everything. Not, you know, it, it applies to communication. It applies to architecture. Uh, the arena in, in Munich is a design product. <laughs> Yes. It's, it's a design. And uh, um, so to open it uh, to our life, design is our life. Design is planet. Sometimes people say to me, what is the most perfect design? I say, it's the Matterhorn. <laughs> the Matterhorn in Zermatt. He is unique. 
It's the only mountain you, you, that you remember. <laughs> he gives to Zermatt the, the success of Zermatt. Zermatt without the matter of will not be Zermatt. And it's a design that comes from planet Earth. So design is a global concept. And as it is global, my goodness, Peter has, wow, he can conquer so many other fields because design is in every field. Design is our life. Design, and, and then in the history books, the, through designs, you will, be know, you will be able to notice the different period of life. So it, it's a mark, it, it's something that is a, like a star, bam. The, 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 the beginning of the 20th century, it's like the stamp of design, boom, boom, boom. And in that sense, we have to see design as a global element and not just uh, uh, on, a, on a phone or on a watch. Jean-Claude, thank you very much indeed. Peter, thank you very much indeed for uh, hosting Jean-Claude today. Jean-Claude, congratulations on being awarded the Red Dot Personality Prize. Thank you Thank you, much. thank it's you very much. Fantastic. Finally at the end, I have to congratulate you. I didn't this all the time, so congratulations. And you are the most honorable winner of this award, and I'm happy that you are the first. So thank you very much for your contribution. Merci, good thank luck. you, Peter. Good thank luck you. with the next steps, Jean-Claude. Bye-bye. Yes. We will bye -bye. remember. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye, -bye. bye.